I don't know about you, but I like new beginnings. That is an opportunity to renew our relationship with God, to hear his voice once more, and to respond in a manner that's going to be pleasing to him. And that's exactly what God is offering Noah and his family in chapter 9 of the book of Genesis. Now, we have seen that that ark has rested in the mountains. Noah waited for several days in order that all the water would, would recede and the animals and also Noah and his family could go forth. They've done that. And here's the first thing that we need to remember. When Noah and his family went out and all the animals with him, the very first thing that Noah did was to build an altar. Now, altar is synonymous with sacrifice. And here, sacrifice is being shared as an instrument of worship. So we see that God spared man. He gave his mercy, his grace, his loving kindness in order that we would have an opportunity to worship him. And realize something, that worship isn't for God's well-being. God is complete. He is perfect. He needs nothing. So whenever he requires something for us to do, it is for our well-being. Good things happen when we worship God. Good things happen when we make sacrifices according to his will, his purposes, his plans in this world. And what is one of the greatest things that comes out of worship? Well, look, if you would, to chapter 9 and verse 1. The context is a worship experience and notice what God says, verse 1, chapter 9. And God bless Noah and his sons. So worship, when we do so properly, when we make the offering that God desires, what's the outcome? Blessing. Now, does that mean that blessing comes just, just naturally? No, it does not. There is a tool or an instrument that assists us being blessed. Now, we need to be careful because we're not talking about salvation. See, the wrath and the judgment of God has already ended. These eight individuals, they have come through the judgment of God. In other words, they, by their faith, and that faith manifested itself because they entered into the ark, and because of that, they were saved from the wrath of God. And now that judgment is over. And we need to ask, how do these individuals who were saved by God, how now should they live? And what's the foundation of their life? Worship. And what is very related to worship? Sacrifice, offering, giving that which we have in order to manifest our love, our commitment to God and his purposes. And when we do that, there's an opportunity to be blessed. Now, why do I say opportunity? Well, look at the context of verse 1 of chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons. How did he do that? Well, just keep reading. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So we learned something. God blessed. But how did he bless? He set before these individuals commandments. What we need to learn is that there is an inherent relationship between blessing and the commandments of God. Now, if you were to ask many people, where is the majority of God's commandments found, the basis for understanding his commandments? The answer would be the Torah. And today, many people, if you were to say there's a connection between the law and being blessed, people get very uncomfortable. Some get angry. Some write kind of mean-spirited emails. 
But what we must understand is that what seems right in our eyes is not always pleasing to God, even if you're a believer. We need to always form our perspective based upon the word of God. And when Moses set the Torah, that is the law before Israel, he says, I set before you this day life and death, blessing and curse. So if we want to have the life that God wants us to have, if we want to experience blessing, the commandments, which do not save us, do not justify us, but these commandments can be utilized so that we experience blessing. God here in verse 1 is giving Noah and his family an opportunity to find his blessing. So it's not controversial. It's pretty straightforward. Once again, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, what can we... Uh, Derive from that, multiply and fill the earth. Now, there was just four couples at this time. And the earth was a pretty big place, and it still is. To fill the earth, I mean, God was, was giving to man some pretty big assignments. And what can we learn from that? God likes abundance. God, when we obey him, the outcome is going to be abundancy. Now, can we say that some other way? Yes, we can. Another word that we can use is prosperity. Now, I've spoken to a lot of people, and I like to look at people when I speak to them. And certain things, when you say this, I can almost anticipate what the response is going to be. Say something else, you get an entirely different response. And when you use the term prosperity in English, people, they get excited. They, they begin to, to look and pay closer attention, and that's fine. But when I say prosperity, I am not necessarily talking about dollars or possessions or success in achieving our goals. No, prosperity is being able to carry out in abundance the things of God. When we speak about prosperity, and there's a connection between prosperity and abundancy, you know what should come into your mind? The glory of God. If you're wise, you're going to make a note of that. Write that in the margin of your Bible. Put that into your journal. Memorize it. There is a biblical connection between prosperity and the abundance of the glory of God. So what God is revealing here is this, when I submit, when I obey, when I say no to my wants, my desires, my plans, and say, no, I'm going to replace them with God's will, God's program, God's plan for my life. When I do that, my hope is that there is going to be an abundancy based upon submissiveness, obedience, carrying out God's will. That there's going to be prosperity and abundance of God's glory being manifested. What does Messiah say? They're going to see your good works and give glory to God. What causes them to give glory to God? A manifestation of his glory. And there's this connection between the glory of God and the presence of God. When we live in obedience, here again, we're not talking now about the means of salvation. Hopefully, we're talking to people who have experienced salvation. And now they want to be used in order to manifest to others that God dwells within them. That they are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so, our utmost desire is prosperity. The abundance of God's glory being seen in one's life. That's what prosperity is. So when he says here, I want you to multiply, be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth. He's talking about he wants us to do things that that are grandiose, much, much more than we ever imagine. But if we do it with God, it's going to be the outcome. 
Look now to verse 2. We know, verse 1, he only spoke to, to Noah and his family, says here his sons. In verse 2, there is an emphasis upon the animal life that was also in the ark and also came forth into the earth once more, dwellers of the land. And notice what God says in regard to these animals. Still speaking to, to Noah and his three sons, and your fear, and, and this next word in Hebrew, it's the word chitchem. Chitchem, uh, chitchem is a word, well, in other places it's translated uh, to be dismayed. Usually it's in the negative in the Bible saying, do not be dismayed. And that's a word of confusion. It's not so popular in the scripture. It's not so popular today in modern Hebrew. But it's related to fear or terror or confusion. And what this scripture is revealing to us is this. That animals are going to be fearful of human beings. And they're going to be confused by us. Meaning they're not going to understand like we can understand and therefore God and this is what it's really saying he's affirming what he did in the garden of Eden where he's given us authority over them so they're going to be submissive now that doesn't mean that all animals are to obey what we say but it simply means that they're going to be afraid fearful confused and oftentimes just run off because we're human beings. I can tell you a personal experience. I was walking, uh, this was a few years ago, not far from my home, out behind where I am right now in the desert. And I saw three wolves. And I had come around this corner, there was a path, and there were these three wolves. Three against one. And I looked at them, and they looked at me. And before I could even think about what to do, they took off running away. Now, they were bigger than me. Three of them, they were stronger. They were faster. They had sharper teeth. I mean, they could easily make a meal out of me. But in an instant and instinctively, they ran. Why? Well, they were confused by me. They didn't know what I was. They don't necessarily perceive human beings as part of the animal race, part of their natural domain. Secondly, not only were they fearful and confused, but notice what else it says here. And your fear and confusion, your confusion, you cause them to be confused, shall be upon every living thing of the earth and upon every fowl of the heavens and with all which crawls upon the ground and also it says here with every all the fishes of the sea into your hand i have given them now this is important it says literally look again it says in your hand I have given them. Now, why is that important? God is doing something different. In the Garden of Eden, we, although we had authority over, they were called to be submissive. I believe that relationship was very, very different. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you look some time at the book of Isaiah in chapter 11, and that chapter speaks of the kingdom. In the kingdom, animals are going to have fear, but they're not going to be confused. What we see here is that a little child is going to lead them. We are going to see that a little toddler, he is going to put his hand into a dangerous uh, uh, hole that a snake lead, lives in, and no harm is going to come upon him. And we're going to see that, that a, a lion will lay down with a lamb and a bear with a calf and they're not going to eat one another. 
So there's a difference between the kingdom of God and our reality today. Likewise, there was a difference between the situation today and the Garden of Eden. But here, we're going to find that the animals, they're going to be fearful, not just submissive, but fearful and confused. And more often than not, they're going to flee. But God says, look at the end of verse, verse 2. He says, into your hand, I've given them. That is, we can utilize them. And what is he speaking about? Well, if we have any doubt, we just keep reading. But let me give you the answer now. Into your hand, I have given them having to do with food. Now, here again, this is also a difference. Because in the Garden of Eden, man could eat all the vegetation, of course, not from the tree in the middle of the, the Garden of Eden, not from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was forbidden, but all the other type of grass and vegetation and fruit and so forth, we could eat. Here he's saying something different. Look now to, to verse 3. All that creeps or every creepy thing which is alive, for you it will be for food just as every green vegetation. So, here is what we call in Hebrew the chidush, the new thing. Previously, forbidden to eat animal life. And now God is saying that he's giving us these animals into our hands for food. Just like we could eat all this vegetation and all these fruits, we can now eat all the animals. No restriction. Now, remember. It's not until Israel rejects God that we find the Torah coming into being through Moses. And in that Torah, we find the dietary laws, cash root, what we oftentimes refer to in English as kosher. But here, there are no, uh, there is no cash root. There is no uh, something that is a devar kasher, a devar, a asur, none of that. Nothing that is, is kosher or unkosher or something that is forbidden and something permitted. All the animal life is, but there is an important restriction. Look now to the end of verse 3. He says, I have given to you et kol, which means I have given you everything. All the animal life. But now verse 4. Verse 4 is the restriction. And let me just simply introduce this by telling you what we're going to learn. And that is, in the next few verses, we're going to see the importance of blood from God's perspective. We're going to see that although animals could be eaten, the blood could not be eaten. And there was great penalty for one doing or violating these these laws so look again at our text look with me if you would to verse 4 but and here's the the exception but flesh with its life now what does it mean flesh with its life it's talking about its blood you shall not eat now we see a very important construction in the hebrew text god is teaching us something and this is something that's going to be very important. It's a principle that's related to the gospel. Because we are all dead in sins and trespasses. That was our previous condition. And what changed that? Messiah shedding his blood. Now, I don't know why, but it's becoming very popular. There are individuals that teach that there's, there's no uh, significance in the fluid, speaking of blood, of Messiah. They simply want to say what's important is his death. Well, his death is important, but his blood needs to be emphasized. Just like we learn in the account of the Exodus, which gives us the, the context, the foundation, the paradigm for understanding our redemption. And there's a connection between redemption and salvation. Redemption and intimacy 
entering into a relationship with God. There's no intimacy in relationship with God without redemption. And God never said, I'm going to look upon that dead Passover lamb and, and remember my promise and pass over you. That's not what he says. He says, I'm going to look upon the blood, the blood that you handled properly, that you put upon the mezuzot, the doorposts, and the mashkof, the, the lintel over the door. He looked upon blood. Blood is highly significant. And that's why these individuals that are moving away from the blood of Messiah, these individuals, they're doing so because they have moved away from an understanding that the Torah still gives revelation to us. Look again at our text, verse, verse 4. But flesh with its life, its blood, in other words, you shall not eat. Move now to verse 5. Now, in verse 5, we're going to see that if that's violated, there's going to be a serious outcome. Now, let me simply point out to you that if you are someone that says, oh, this is the Old Testament, I put much more, more significance on the New Testament. Well, let me tell you that if you go to the book of Acts in chapter 15, it's speaking about what to share with new Gentile believers. And one of the things that, that James or Yaakov, which is the, was the leader of the believers in Jerusalem, what he shared, and this is during the time of Paul, he shared, it's forbidden to eat meat with, with blood in it. In fact, it's forbidden to eat blood Absolutely never can we eat blood. So we read here in verse, verse 5. And your blood of your soul. Now, the word here, nephesh, it's usually translated soul. It can be translated person or a living being. And it has to do with a, a body being alive. The soul is still there. So what he says in this passage, he says, if your blood is still in your soul, and the implication is someone uh, uh, eats it or takes it, he says, I will require the life of that man. So if we mishandle blood, it is going to bring about Death is going to bring about the judgment of God. All of this, what we see in verse 5 is simply God wanting to say this is important. How we understand blood and how we respond and, and behave in regard to it has serious implications. And he goes on and says this. He says, I will require it. Look now to, to verse, verse 5 in the second part of that verse. And from the hand of a man, from the hand of a man, his brother, I will require the life of that man. Why? If it's mishandled. If a man takes, and this is vital, if a man takes a life, and of course, we're going to learn later on, there are exceptions to this. War, for example. If there's a, a sentence, a death sentence, a man violated you are able to take that man's life. But on a regular basis, it is forbidden to kill. That's what God is saying. And it gets very, very interesting because here, what it says in this passage, look again, let's go back to verse 5. But your blood for your souls or of your souls, I require from the hand of a beast of an animal i will require it so if an animal i skipped over that previously if an animal takes the life of a human being god requires that animal to be put to death secondly if man doesn't do that god will carry it out uh, himself he will require it secondly from the hand of a man a man of a hand of a man of his brother meaning 
if a man's hand takes the life of his brother, I will require the life of that man. It makes it very clear. Look now at verse 6. The one who sheds blood of a man, with that man, his blood will be shed. So we're talking about a punishment. God will require, just like he does an animal to be put to death, God is going to require the blood of that man who slayed another one to, to be dealt with in that way. So why is that? Look now at the end of, of verse, verse 6. He's going to do that because for in the image of God, he made the man. Now, that scripture, of course, it's taken from the book of Genesis earlier on in chapter 1, and it has such implications. For in the image of God, this man was made. God made a man. And, of course, that's an inclusive term, also women. It speaks of the fact that we're called to reflect God's glory. And when our life is taken unjustly, improperly, it attacks the very glory of God. And therefore, there's going to be serious consequences of that. Now move on to, to verse 7. He reiterates what he said earlier. Be fruitful and multiply, but there's a change. Instead of the word to fill the earth, it says, and it's the word shirtsu. Shirtsu, now... Earlier on in the scripture, we've come across that word. It means the old English word would be to team. And that's a old word, which means to, to make in abundance. So it's simply a word that, that gives us a proper understanding that when it says fill the earth, it means fill the earth in a manner of abundance. God wants it more doesn't like small things. He says, don't despise small beginnings, but he doesn't want to keep them small. God likes large things. He likes abundance. What does the scripture say in Luke? When God gives, he gives pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. So what this word is trying to tell us is that God wants us to thoroughly carry out these commandments. You be fruitful and multiply and, and make an abundance in the land and multiply in it. So he twice in this verse uses the word ravu, which has to do with making that of uh, the word rav means uh, multiply in an abundant fashion. Verse 8. And God said to Noah and to his sons who were with him, saying, I am. Behold, I am making, or literally, establishing. It's the word makim. I am establishing my covenant with you and your seed. Your seed is offspring or descendants, is children. Your offspring after you. So God is doing something here. God is making a covenant. And what we find being revealed here in the context is that there's a connection between covenant and promise. What we're going to learn is that this covenant that God is establishing with Noah and his family is a covenant, a promise, and here's the key. This promise is all upon God to keep. And what is the nature of this covenant? Well, we'll see that in a few minutes. But notice that God wants to make this not just with Noah and this immediate family, but he's going to extend it to all human people. And he promises something, and what is that? Well, keep reading once more, verse, verse 8. And God said to Noah and to his sons who were with him, saying, And I, behold, I am establishing my covenant with you and your seed after you, verse 10, and with all the living beings, including animals. And all the living beings, animals that are with you, also the fowl and the beasts, meaning the domesticated animals, and all animals of the earth that are with you 
from all that went forth from the ark and every living thing or all the animals on the earth. So the word here, and the reason why I'm going back and forth because the word chaya comes from the word for life or living. It's also chaya can be an animal or a beast, but I've been translating the word behima as beast, meaning a domesticated animal. But the point is this, God is making a covenant, not just with humanity, but also all life, including birds and every type of animal life. Now, why is that important? Because we learn something. We learn in this passage that animals are important to God. You see, many people might teach that when we go before the flood, the reason why God brought these animals to the ark, to Noah and placed them upon the ark, was for the purpose of preserving them. Now, that's not the case. We learned something different. God didn't just want to preserve them. He could have, what? He could have recreated all these animals in a second. He could have just spoke and it would have been, the earth would have been full of them. But he didn't do that because he wanted to show us that he had compassion and mercy on the animals. And that should cause us to have that same thought that we should have mercy, compassion over animals, even though God has given them into our hands. There's a sense of responsibility. And this is being loudly proclaimed through this covenant. Now, we still haven't seen the nature of this covenant. We see that it's with all life, both human and animal life. Secondly, it reveals that God wants to make a promise. And what's that promise? We're coming to it. But look, if you would, to verse, verse 11. He says here, And I will establish my covenant with you, and I will not yikur it. I will not destroy or cut off flesh, all flesh, anymore from the waters of the flood. And it will not any longer be again a flood to destroy the earth. So here's the promise of that, of that covenant that God's making. That he's not going to destroy the world again by means of me mabul, that is the waters of the flood. Now, we got to be careful because many people will say God will never destroy this world. Well, God is going to bring great devastation on this world. All those who do not exercise faith, do not enter into a covenant, do not pursue the promise of God, they will be destroyed. And they'll be destroyed by, by fire that's going to fall from this, this, uh, this heaven. And through other uh, catastrophes and happenings that, that is going to be brought about through God's wrath. But he's promising here never to destroy the world and all that's in it through the flood waters. That's what we see here. Now look at verse 12. And God spoke. This is the sign of the covenant which I am setting between me and between you and between all living uh, beings, meaning the animals, which are with you throughout Le Dorot Olam. You could say throughout the generations of, of the world. Now, he's making this as a promise. And he says here, this is going to be my, and he uses the word, oat, a sign. Now, we've talked about the significance of that word, oat. It has to do with a miraculous thing that only God can do. Leaves nothing to the imagination, and oat is something that God and God alone does. And God does what? Well, notice what he says. Once again, verse 12. And God said, this is my sign, miraculous sign, oat, the sign of the covenant, which I am giving or setting between me and between you and between all living life, 
which is with you throughout the generations of this world. And what is that? Verse 13, we have it. He says, my keshet. Now, the word keshet is a bow, but here we're talking about, and you all know this, a rainbow. And God is saying something here. And all of this is not just to teach us about the fact that God's not going to destroy the world again with water, but we learn something else. We learn certain things about a covenant. And what do we learn? Look again, verse 12, verse 13. And my keshet, that is my rainbow, I will put in the clouds and it shall be for an oath, a sign of my covenant between me and between the earth. Now, he concludes that verse by not saying all life. Now it's even extended to include all the earth. Verse 14. And it shall come about. And this next word is interesting because it's literally the word for cloud. Now, most translated as a verb. He says here, when I bring a cloud over the earth. There should appear a bow, a, a rainbow in the cloud. But you can actually translate it a little differently. It, can, it shall be in my cloud, a cloud over the earth. So he's simply specifying in my cloud. He's going to pick a certain cloud. You're not going to see it in all the clouds. You're only going to see it in the one that he has chosen. And it's going to be a sign. It's going to be above the earth. And it will appear a rainbow in the cloud. Verse 15. Now, I mentioned to you that we're going to learn things about a covenant. I share with you that there's a connection between the word liskor, remember, and the word covenant. They go together. And here's one of the bases for having such a position. Look, if you would, to verse 15. And I will remember my covenant, which is between you, between me and between you and between every living thing with all flesh. And it will no longer be any more that the waters of the flood shall destroy all flesh. So God's going to look at that and remember it. Now, what's that? why is that important? What's it teaching us? Well, is the world any less corrupt than it was in Genesis chapter 6? And the answer is, no, it's not. Probably more corrupt. So why doesn't God, why doesn't he destroy it? Well, he's made a promise. He would want to, his character would cause him to bring destruction upon all this wickedness. But he does not. Why? A covenant. Now, here's another important thing that you should write down. There is a power that is in a covenant. When God sees the covenant, it has the power to do what? It has the power to stop God's judgment. Now, here again. In no way does this attack the sovereignty of God. God put this law in force. And he's done so for the purpose of teaching us. See, the world deserves God's judgment right now. We should have another flood today. It should begin pouring down rain. We deserve to be wiped from the planet. And what causes God not to do it? Because he issued a covenant. And there's power in that covenant. And when God sees that, that rainbow, he remembers. Now, what does that mean? It's putting it in terms that we can understand. When there's a covenant, it causes God to remember his promises. And if he remembers them, they're going to be needed out to us. So, verse 15. I will remember my covenant which is between me and between you and between all living beings in, with all flesh. 
and it will be that the flood waters will no longer destroy all flesh. Verse 16. And the rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look at it, and I will remember Brit Olam, my eternal covenant. Now, this is an important statement. We're really coming to one of the most important principles that we're learning here. Because that phrase, Brit Olam, and today we're living in a wonderful time. We can take out our phones, go to our computers, and just put in that phrase, Brit Olam, eternal covenant. And what do we learn? Well, this is a prophetic term. Usually we don't see it. So early on, we don't see it. In, in places such as this, we see it in the prophecies. We see it in regard to the last days. We see it in regard to a new covenant, which is an eternal covenant. So why does that phrase, Brit Olam, an eternal covenant, or a kingdom covenant, the word Olam can be also understood as referring to the kingdom. Why does it appear here? Because God's trying to teach us a principle. If one has a covenant with God, he has a promise from him. And that covenant has power to make sure the promise of God is always maintained. And what is this Brit Olam? It has nothing to do with us. God's not saying, you know what? Those who enter into this covenant, well, you know what? We're part of that covenant. We didn't make any decision whatsoever. God made that himself as a promise that he gave to humanity and all the animals that he would never act as he did in Genesis 6 and 7. When he saw the corruption, the wickedness, the evil in our hearts and he was moved by his righteousness to punish, he says, I'm not going to do that in the same way. Even though this year, last year, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, we deserved the flood. God says, I'm not going to do it because of my covenant. Now, he is going to destroy this world by fire, the fire of his wrath. But if we have another Brit Olam, the one that he refers to the prophets refer to the one that Messiah Yeshua and his blood ratified and established, then we're not going to be experiencing that, that wrath of his. He's going to remember that covenant and he's going to remove us so that we do not taste the wrath of God. Look again at verse 16. And the rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look at it and I will remember my Brit Olam, this eternal covenant between God and between every living being with all flesh, which is upon the earth. Verse 17. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of my covenant, which I have established between me and between all flesh, which is upon the earth. Now, what I want to close with is this. You know, after it rains, so frequently, we look at that rainbow. And we remember, yes, God has promised Noah not to make another flood. So we can take some uh, comfort. Oh, it's not going to rain uh, too much longer. It's not going to flood this whole earth. That's the wrong message. That's only part of it. The way the scripture is written, we should Think of another covenant, a messianic covenant, that every time that we see that rainbow, we should be reminded that we're not going to experience the wrath of God, not because we don't deserve it, but because God has promised us. And in the same way, that rainbow keeps God from bringing destruction of water upon this earth. We can be assured that that Messianic covenant, that other Brit Olam through the blood of Messiah Yeshua is going to keep God's wrath from ever touching us. Not because of who we are, 
Not because we deserve it, but because God has promised. And in the same way that he's kept that promise for, for almost 6,000 years, we can be assured that he's going to keep that promise and the promise that he made through his only begotten son, Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus Christ. He is going to keep that promise forever and ever. Why? Because it's a Brit Olam, an eternal covenant. Well, we'll close with that until next week, and we continue on and enter into Genesis and chapter 10.